David G. Savage, author of Turning Right, The Making of the Rehnquist Supreme Court. Why a book now about the nine justices of the Supreme Court? Well, I think the court's uh, undergone something of a historic uh, transformation in the last five years. The, the five years I was lucky enough to be covering the court. I think it's really similar to what happened in the late 30s. Within a few years, uh, you know, Franklin Roosevelt had been frustrated by the conservative court, the nine old men. And within a few years, Roosevelt was able to pack the court, to change the court, through the uh, traditional appointments process. He, he appointed um, the, the older conservatives retired. The younger liberals came on the court, and the court changed entirely from a court that had been a protector of big business to a court that was increasingly the protector of individual rights and civil rights for minorities, essentially the court that we've come to know since World War II. I, I really think the process is now working in reverse and, and has changed fairly quickly in the last few years. Um, in the 70s and early 80s, it was a very balanced court with sort of four liberals and four conservatives and Lewis Powell right in the middle. And uh, a lot of the fairly liberal decisions of this court came in the mid-70s, uh, Roe versus Wade, uh, upholding affirmative action in Bakke. As you know, uh, Reagan was frustrated through much of his term with the Supreme Court. They, they made no progress on issues like abortion or school prayer. And then in, that, in 1986, when Berger stepped down, he elevated Rehnquist, Scalia was added to the court, and then uh, Anthony Kennedy in 1988, and now uh, David Souter and Clarence Thomas. So now it's a court that has about uh, seven, essentially seven conservative members. The two liberals on the court are um, John Paul Stevens and uh, Harry Blackman, two Midwestern Republicans. They're the, the left wing of this current court. So one of the reasons to write the book is to say that it uh, is to let people know something about, uh, give them sort of a close-up look at an institution that's not particularly well-known, partly because of no television cameras. They don't do interviews. They don't allow C-SPAN's cameras in to, to uh, televise the court, or they don't come on these programs and discuss why we made the decisions we made. So on the one hand, I wanted to sort of shed some light on this institution. And uh, secondarily, I think it's because it's undergoing something of a, a momentous uh, shift. Do you still cover the court for the LA Times? I certainly do. Are you a lawyer? No, I'm not. How did you get interested in the law? Well, I got the opportunity to cover this court. It was one, I had been an education writer for the paper. I'd written a little bit about the court in the late uh, 70s, mostly on education cases, affirmative action, and a number of the cases came out of schools or uh, universities. Um, I was always a fan of the court, interested in the court. My view is that it's one of the great uh, beats for a newspaper reporter. As I mentioned, unlike the White House or politics or even Congress to some degree. It's not an uh, institution that's all driven by television or geared to television. Uh, we get great cases, uh, sort of uh, legal disputes that have split the courts across the country. They come up to the Supreme Court. We get all these uh, briefs on both sides, good lawyers on both sides. And the court also writes a 30-page opinion saying, here's what we're deciding and here's why we're deciding it. And so I find it a, it's a terrific beat for a... Uh, newspaper reporter. It's sort of a paper and pencil. Can you remember the first time you ever went to the court? I think the first argument uh, was the Bakke case in 1978. Why were you there? To, to cover it. For education? Yes. On yes, the education I, beat? Yes, that's correct. Can you remember your first thought about what you were watching in that courtroom and what were the first things that caught your attention? Well, it's something like going into a great cathedral or going into a church. You know, the, the, the uh, uh, they're like pews, and everybody sits quietly and waits for the justices to enter. It has that high ceiling, and the, it has sort of an august sense to it. You feel like you're in a, uh, a cathedral, a cathedral of the law. Um, I was very impressed then and continue to be to watch the justices uh, hear an argument and debate a case. Uh, I go to a lot of uh, hearings in the Senate or the House, and, and C-SPAN certainly covers those. He's given your viewers some sense of what those are like. And frequently you hear people delivering testimony and the senators sort of rock back in their seats and, and many of them pay little attention when they have a question to ask and the aide slips them a question and they... Where the justices, by contrast, you could tell they've read all the briefs, they're really up on the case, and even if it's a fine point of tax law or whatever, three or four of them will be up on the edge of their seats, the whole argument uh, 
batting the issue back and forth with the attorney. So I'm, I was also impressed from the beginning that um, you could tell these people were really involved in their, in their work and really uh, up on the uh, cases that were being argued. So I found it fascinating. I'm going to jump to a non sequitur completely. You write on a couple of occasions in your book about the poker game. Well, that's, uh, you mean the Rehnquist uh, sure. board crowd? That's uh, evidently been a long-running institution. They get together once a month and play poker. It's uh, some of the prominent conservative uh, judges. Uh, Scalia has been a regular member. Bork shows up on occasion. I've told people like Bill Bennett they're uh, occasional participants. Do you know where they have it? I, th I think they move it around to different houses. It's, uh, each of them gets it every couple months. What do I've you never been invited, by the way, so you're getting a second and third hand count of this. But how do you know about it? it well, but people talk about it. Rehnquist talks about it and Scalia will talk about it. Is, uh, is it for a particular reason and how long have they been doing it, do you know? Uh, I know it's been a number of years. I think it's just sort of their, a fun night out to uh, talk about something other than the law and get together with old friends. If you were to, again, go back to your first visit to the court in 78 mm -hmm. and all the times you've been there, just for the, for the moment, if someone spent a week in the court just watching all the oral arguments in one week how many oral ar arguments do they see in in any given week well usually the court hears cases on monday tuesday and wednesday and they hear four uh... cases uh, they have uh, arguments they're an hour-long argument each side gets a half hour the chief justice cuts you off in the middle of the sentence if you go beyond your half hour so they do four a day uh... for those three days so twelve in a week in a week now how many weeks would they have like that a year well, they meet from October through, they have arguments through the end of April, and essentially they're doing it just two weeks of each month. So they tend to hear 12 cases one week, 12 cases the next, and then essentially they spend the next two weeks working on opinions and preparing for the next 12. It, I should add, they hear these arguments on, as I say, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and then they get together Friday morning in the conference room behind closed doors, no one's there other than the nine justices, and vote on those cases. However it comes out, the majority then, you know, goes back. One person is assigned to write the opinion, and as many dissenters uh, can write as they choose. So they spend an awful lot of time working in their chambers writing opinions. It's not, I frequently hear people say, well, you mean the court's not in session this week? Um, and that simply means that they're not on the bench or not handing out opinions, but they're very busy up there working on the opinions and the cases they've already heard. I want to talk a lot about the people, the, the nine justices, but just for a, a moment, let's talk about the oral arguments. Again, if you can go into that court and sit there and watch it, and I might ask you, can the general public do that? Sure. There are not a lot. Of, there are about a hundred seats. People line up and uh, outside the court. I have to say, everybody tends to come on Monday morning at ten o'clock, and my impression is the best time to get in is say Tuesday afternoon or Wednesday afternoon. Everyone seems to assume if you have to come right at ten o'clock, which is when the first argument begins, and they'll be but there'll be a hundred or two hundred people in line so not all those people get in how long can you stay seated I th you know I don't know I think they have some people come in for a relatively short period say five minutes and others can stay up to a half hour can you stay the whole day um, I'm not sure whether they'll let you stay through several arguments I know you can stay through one all right let's because you can you can go in any time you want to they have a few pews up on the left side for reporters, so I, I can go up and listen to the Let audience. me name the justices and, and uh, ask you to just give the first impression that someone would have if they sat and watched only the oral argument. Only the oral argument? Only the oral argument. What, would, what are the characteristics of, say, Chief Justice Rehnquist? Uh, he's usually quiet in the oral arguments. He uh, cuts off lawyers if they uh, start to rhapsodize and give a uh, lecture. He's generally uh, a courteous fellow. He's a very nice guy. Uh, Rehnquist is not well known to the general public, but I find him one of the uh, really pleasant sort of down-to-earth people you could ever meet. I mean, the, the assumption is if you're going to meet somebody who's the Chief Justice of the United States, they'd be something of a, a haughty or a pompous person. And Rehnquist is just uh, the most ordinary, pleasant fellow you could ever meet. At least I've always found him to be that way. How long has he been there? Uh, he came, he was appointed by Nixon in the fall of uh, 1971. He actually took his seat in January of 1972, so it's been 20 years now that he's been up there. Chief Justice since? 86, fall of 86. What would you remember about Sandra Day O'Connor? She's a tough questioner, very direct, uh, very lawyerly. She's not, uh, you know, sort of a, a feminist or she doesn't have a 
particularly female approach to handling cases, she's the one who usually asks the first tough question. Frequently, lawyers will be three sentences into their uh, argument, um, and O'Connor will ask a question that should have knocks a hole right in the middle of their case. She's always well prepared, a very sharp questioner. Has she recovered from her cancer? She se uh, seems to be doing quite fine. She underwent some treatment uh, several years ago, but seems to be entirely healthy. Anthony Kennedy. He's a more mild-mannered, uh, quiet person. I think Kennedy has suffered a little bit from the fact that he seemed to be in the shadow of uh, Rehnquist and Scalia and, to some degree, Sandra O'Connor, the more dominant uh, conservatives on the court. Uh, he has a sort of professorial demeanor, uh, asks sort of involved questions, but in a very... Uh, he, he doesn't sort of go after the attorneys like, I'm going to bite your leg off like Scalia will, will but uh, asks these more professorial questions. Do, the, do any of the justices laugh, or is there any joking at all? There's not a lot. Uh, Scalia will occasionally uh, provoke some laughter. Rehnquist occasionally gets in a sarcasm now and then. And what is uh, Justice Scalia's questioning like? He's the most aggressive questioner, uh, the person who goes after the attorneys on both sides. I remember somebody wrote a couple years ago, if, if uh, your cameras and others were televising the court, uh, that Nino Scalia would be a household word around the country because he's, he's quick-witted, he's, he's pointed, he's, he can be funny on the bench, he gets angry and outraged at, at some response. You know, he'll put his hand on his head and be just sort of exasperated by an answer. He's the most lively uh, questioner on the court. And, and uh, if you're on the wrong side from his point of view, he, he will work them over. Is there a sound system in the room? Oh, sure. I mean, it's sort of, when uh, any one of them, even if they almost whisper into the microphone, there'll be this, the microphones are turned up and they'll sort of boom throughout the room. Do they interrupt each other? Uh, they interrupt the attorneys. They try not to interrupt each other. I mean, they, they, uh, the idea is that uh, if I'm the attorney, I'm speaking to you, uh, Justice Lamb, and... and uh, and, um, and, and, and no, there's not a lot of back and forth among the justices interrupting each other's questions. A couple years ago, I remember there was a dispute or a change over whether you call someone Mr. Justice Scalia or Justice Scalia. What is it? It's, ju uh, it's justice. I think they avoided the Mr. because of the uh, uh, Justice O'Connor coming along. It, uh, it complicated what had always been a Mr. Justice so-and-so. So, -and -so. so th they just go to the straight justice. Again, these oral arguments are one hour long. Mm -hmm. Each side gets a half hour, right? and we're talking about what the justices are like to watch if you're sitting in the courtroom. How about uh, David Souter? Well, Souter is extremely impressive asking questions. He's a, um, your viewers, uh, I'm sure, saw him during the confirmation hearings in the Senate in the fall of 1990. He has that distinctive New England accent. He, he's not one who jumps on the attorneys and gets in the first question, but toward the latter half of an argument, he'll ask a quite thoughtful, involved question, usually goes to the heart of the issue. Uh, he's got a very logical mind. I'm always impressed with uh, Souter's questions. He, I'm, I might say he's not as, uh, so good writing opinions. He tends to write sort of muddy and mushy opinions, but speaking or asking questions, he's very uh, penetrating and direct. By the way, did any of these justices talk to you for this book? Sure. I was able to talk to most of them. On the record? Uh, no. No. They, you know, I could go by their chambers or go out to lunch with them or something like that. What I found it most useful for was to um, sort of talk a little bit about what I was planning to write or uh, planning to say and getting some sense of, you know, they could set me straight on a few points or elaborate on something that none of them want to do on the record interviews. When we read in the book that Justice Rehnquist felt this way, does that mean that you talked to him about that and you know that he felt that way? Some, some is that and some I've talked to uh, clerks or other people who, who said, uh, you know, Rehnquist had this, always had this particular view on that subject. He, he never agreed with this, he favored that. And so, you know, in, in some of the contexts I'll say Rehnquist had believed this. And some of it is because it's something he's written or said. I mean, I, I do get to hear them a lot on the bench, and, uh, and one of the good things about the job is you read these people's views as, as how they decide cases year after year. And, you know, if I gave you a hundred tough issues and said, write me 30 pages on your view on that issue, 
after a while, I get a pretty good sense of your views and what you think. If we see quote marks around anything in this book from one of these justices, is, is any of that from a conversation you had with him? Yes, yes. Yes, some of that I used in... Uh, um, did you have to clear it with them? No, no. When you sat down and talked to them, did you say this was on or off the record? Or, I mean, what were the ground rules? I, I, I think the general understanding was that it was a sort of a background interview. I wasn't going to quote them. Uh, I certainly didn't want to, you know, pin them down to saying anything that would be embarrassing. But I wanted to be able to use some sense of what they said. In, in other words, again, if you told me a whole series of things and said, uh, you know, I don't want to be quoted on this, but... Uh, the understanding is I could say that, you know, in some sense, uh, Brian Lamb believes this or feels that is true or whatever. They're the only people in the government that have tenure, stay there forever and ever. Why right. are they so concerned about being quoted and talking to the public at large? Well, it's, uh, it's a good question. I, I think they believe that their job is done best if they are sort of removed from the public and the public arena and the press. Um, that they are these really nine magisterial uh, figures in black robes who interpret the Constitution and hand down decisions that are just that. They're not Bill Rehnquist's personal view and Nino Scalia's view, that they are um, legal interpretations of the Constitution. And I think if they thought if they came on this program or others and, and spouted off on a whole series of um, either legal questions or views of their colleagues or whatever, that that would change the public's view of them and that it might change the view of the Supreme Court. That's, that's how I best understand it, that they think it's better for the court and better for the system of justice if they are somewhat removed from the sort of give and take of, of uh, the political arena. Let's get back to the justices and how they question in the oral argument. Um, Justice Harry Blackman. He says almost nothing. He's a very, uh, he, he will rarely ask any question, and when it is, it's usually <laughs> a very minor point. He'll ask, uh, you know, some attorney will be talking about some criminal case, and he'll ask, where is that town located? Is that near Minneapolis, or is that, you know, he asks little questions like that. He's not an active questioner on the bench. Justice Paul, John Paul Stevens. He's uh, terrific. He, he and Scalia, I think, are really quick-witted people who engage the attorneys. Um, Stevens, uh, I wrote in the book, is the one justice who can sort of unravel, pull a string and unravel the fabric of an attorney's argument right before his eyes. He's a very quick, um, for pure brain power, I think uh, Stevens is at the top in this uh, court. Byron White. He's a tough, gruff guy. I still th sometimes think he seems to go around with his football helmet still on. He occasionally will ask a gruff question of the attorneys, not, not a long philosophical question, but sort of a you know, direct jab, and he wants a yes or no answer. He doesn't want a long explanation. He'll say, you know, is it yes or no? Yes or no? Has he been on the court the longest? Right. Uh, he, JFK picked him something like April 3rd of uh, 1962, he went up to the Senate, had like a one-hour hearing, was approved on a voice vote, and was on the court within two weeks, just to show you how things have changed in 30 years. So he just celebrated his 30th year on the court, 75 years old. Does month. he appear to be 75 years old? Well, he appears to be in good shape for 75 years old. You don't want to shake hands with him. He, he'll, uh, he still has a crusher handshake. Um, but it is the case that, uh, you know, when you see him walking in the halls, he walks with sort of a stoop. He's had a sore back for years, so he looks old in that sense. I, I don't think he'd want to run the football anymore. Clarence Thomas. He, too, says almost nothing. He, he sits back. Um, you know, he came in uh, both under a cloud and a month into the term. I don't think Thomas was as grounded in the law as uh, some of his colleagues, other people who come up to the court. So he's uh, done a lot of studying and done a lot of reading, but he does not participate too much in the oral arguments. I think he really wants to bide his time, and I think he'd prefer that we didn't write about him and uh, sort of ignored him for a couple of years. I think he'd like to sort of keep a low profile for a few years, if that's possible. Assume you've never been to Washington, you've never been in the court, and you've never met a justice. How different would you feel 
about the Supreme Court, its members, what they do, and the whole thing over there if you've got to do what you've done? Well, I think you'd come away impressed, as I said, with how uh, hardworking these people are, because you'll go into the court and they'll be arguing about, you know, whether S Section 1610 of the Bankruptcy Code requires that there be a 90-day waiting period or a 160-day waiting period before something is, you know, it'll be frequently a, a arcane technical matter. And, you know, my first reaction is if I were coming in off the street, I would think, my goodness, how do these people get interested and in, involved in those kind of narrow questions? I understand Roe versus Wade and affirmative action or flag burning, but even the uh, narrow questions of, uh, of uh, you know, some technical aspect of um, tax law or labor law or whatever, these people are very in involved and very, uh, you know, they'll say, well, but in 1967 we said this, and 1976 we said that now how do we come back and you know you know how do you do we view this case they'll say to the lawyers give us a reason as to why we should come out your way in this case when we said these two things before and you quickly get the sense i mean these people are really immersed in in their business which one of the nine justices is the most social outgoing you find them out in the washington uh party circle I, I think scalia probably, maybe Justice O'Connor, but Scalia would, uh, I'd mentioned in the book, there was one evening we saw him leaving the court with a little, with his tuxedo on, which he, somebody commented on his dress, and he said, to him, oh yes, esteemed jurist by day, man about town at night, and <laughs> I think that seems to be his view of himself, but Justice O'Connor is somebody who gets out quite a bit, too. Who never goes out? Well, I think Thomas is, is close to that category. Uh, he, is, uh, he and his wife are, as I understand it, building a new house even further out of town. I think they sort of keep to themselves. And I think Harry Blackman is not a particularly uh, party animal, although at uh, 83 years old, I suppose most people are not. You paint a picture in the book of David Souter before he was appointed, uh, living in an old farmhouse up in Ware, New Hampshire. Does he still do that? Is he still a bachelor? Is he a recluse? Well, I'm not sure. He's, he's definitely a hard worker, a guy who spends a lot of time at the court, takes work home. He has an apartment here in uh, D.C. and likes to go out running at night or whatever. I mean, he t he, from what people tell me and from what he says, he, he works all day, and uh, his, his evening consists of getting home at 9 o'clock, going out and running, and then uh, coming home and reading some more and going to bed. So he is... In that sense, he's, uh, it's something of a reclusive life. He'd, it, it's not totally reclusive, though. I mean, he does get invitations from George Bush to go to plays or, or go to ball games or whatever. I mean, he does have some you, social life. You wrote that after uh, they did a profile in the Washington Post on him that, and called him the mo one of the most eligible bachelors in town, that he got 267 phone calls or something like that to the court. How did you find that out? Oh, he... he told us that. We had a little reception for him at the court, and he was quite amused that, um, first of all, that this piece, sort of uh, tongue-in-cheek piece about David Souter as being the Washington's ideal eligible bachelor, but he said, uh, and he said, you know, I received 275 phone calls. And then he said, I was quite distressed to find, however, that uh, they didn't keep any of the numbers. <laughs> so I, he, was, he was just amused, particularly his first couple months here in Washington, it was such a transition to be, uh, you know, essentially an unknown judge in a small New Hampshire town to being the kind of person where you walk down the street and people know who you are. I think he's been pleased recently that the anonymity is returning. He tells the story about going back up to Concord and going to a grocery store and an old man seeing him in the parking lot saying, uh, hey, you look like that lawyer fella. And Souter said, well, uh, I am. And the guy looked at him again and said, the hell you are. <laughs> and just turned around and walked away. So Souter considers that a sign of good news that his uh, anonymity is returning. We also tell the story about Justice Kennedy on the steps of the Supreme Court? Yes, that was not long after he was confirmed. The one time uh, when you are really well known as a Supreme Court justice is, is, is those uh, weeks when you are before the Senate being confirmed and just afterwards. Justice Kennedy likes to go out walking around the court and, and came out on the steps one day and a young couple came over and said, oh, can, can we uh, snap a photo? And his first thought was, of course, they wanted to take a photo on, on the steps. And of course, they had no idea who he was. They wanted him to take a snapshot of them in, uh, in front of the court. 
I'd, I'd also cited the story of uh, John Paul Stevens had mentioned to me that um, you know he looks like a Supreme Court justice in my view with the little bow tie and the the white hair. Uh, he said he occasionally will go out on the steps in the afternoon and uh, to stand in the sun and the tourists will stand at the bottom of the steps and wave him to please uh, step aside. Uh, they want to take a picture of the front of the building and they don't want to get him in the middle and sort of messing up the photo. And once again, I mean, even standing on the steps of the Supreme Court, the general public has, has no idea, you know, who these people are. What about ages and health of the nine justices? Well, Blackman will be 84 in November at the time of the election. So he's the uh, oldest member of the court and is, is um, he's had some prostate trouble before. I think he's generally viewed as the person now who's in perhaps the weakest health. But you never know. I mean, uh, he, he, the author of Roe versus Wade, I mean, the common speculation is as long as Roe is still there and can be defended, Blackman is going to stay and defend it. Byron White is 75 uh, in June. You know, he was two weeks uh, younger than John F. Kennedy, and 75 years old uh, now. John Paul Stevens is 72 this spring. He's had some prostate trouble, but he strikes me as a particularly buoyant uh, fellow. I mean, he, he does not, to, to see him walk or be around him, he doesn't look like somebody who's 70 years old. He gets up early, works hard. He, flies down to Florida and has a, where he has a condominium, plays a lot of tennis. He's, he's quite an active, energetic uh, person. You mentioned in the book that uh, on the Mondays when they just announce the decisions, right. often he won't be there and he'll stay down in Florida at his condominium. Right. Uh, are they allowed to do that or what's the, what are the rules? Yes, uh, if, uh, I mean, they need to be there to, to vote and they need to be there to hear arguments. But I think, you know, I mean, if you want to... Uh, you're an assigned an opinion or whatever, you can go to Florida or wherever you want and uh, do your work. And the, uh, the announcements of the opinions on the bench are, are merely a, sort of a ceremonial occasion. You don't have to be there for that. What about the age uh, and health of uh, Senator Dale O'Connor? We talked a little bit about this earlier. Yeah, she is in, uh, I guess would be 62 this year. She was born in 1930. She seems to, she says she's in quite good health. I mean, she did have the uh, breast cancer operation, but, and underwent some treatment, but is said to be back playing golf and tennis. And uh, as, as I say, a very hard worker. If you go up there on Saturday, she's going to be at the building with her clerks going over cases. Uh, I'm always uh, in, amused by that. You can go up to the court. I can get in on the weekends and go down in the press room and read briefs or whatever. And if you go out in the halls, you almost invariably see one of the justices looking for an, a vending machine or whatever. They're up there, even when they're, you know, 80-some years old, still up there on Saturdays and Sundays working. What about the ages and health of Clarence Thomas and uh, Antonin Scalia, uh, David well, Souter? Well, they're Antonin. all the, you know, sort of the relative kids on the court. Uh, Thomas is, must be uh, 44, and uh, Souter, uh, Scalia, and um, Kennedy are in their essentially early to mid-50s in fine health. and. You know, I mean, the presumption is that they're going to be there to the year 2010 or year 2020. That's when they'll turn 80 years old, so they've got decades to go. Who named the book Turning Right? Uh, myself and the editor. Um, I wanted to give the sense... I think there can be a lot of debate about where the court should be. You know, they, you know if you use the notion of the swinging pendulum... Somebody can say, well, isn't, hasn't the court come back from being far left to being in the middle? And I'm not going to argue with that, but I think unquestionably the court has turned to the right uh, in the last few years. I, I tried to make this book, uh, and it's not a sermon on, uh, you know, here's what the court, here's what they've done and here's why this is right or wrong. I think with all the big issues in the cases, I try to um, explain, really, Here's what the arguments were. The conservative members of the court said this, the liberals have this view, and here's how a case came out. And I really tried to do my best to uh, sort of explain this for uh, the reader who might be, you know, read about the court in headlines or something like that, have an interest in them, but, uh, but not really uh, uh, have a way to uh, read in some more depth about what the cases were about or the, uh, what these people are like. And so, as I say, I tried. I did not want to write a book that says, 
here's the right way to think about all these issues, and here's my view about it, and, and so on. I, I, I mean, I can be, I suppose any reader can judge for themselves, but I try to, um, as best I could, uh, sort of present both sides to all the cases and, and really let the readers decide, you know, if I heard these arguments and I was presented with the law and I was presented with these facts, how would I have decided that case? And then you can sort of see Justice A decided it this way and Justice B decided it that way. And, you know, you can sort of see for yourself, is that what I've gone this way or that way on, these, on this type of case? You've been covering the court for five years for the L.A. Times. Is it more interesting or less interesting as a beat for you today? Well, I think it gets, it gets more interesting for me all the time because I find that I learn a lot about a particular area of law, whether it's antitrust law or some version of the free speech law or free press that I was not, I had some sense of before, but I didn't really understand it until we went through a couple big cases on that. So I feel like I uh, know the areas better and uh, it's also the it's a great place to learn a lot I mean the the uh, good thing about covering the Supreme Court if you're not a lawyer is that the briefs are good you get lower court opinions they have all the facts in a case and you can really if you're willing to put in the time you can you can read enough so that you really do understand or at least you seem to understand what this case is about and what it means how many books have you written well, I've, this is my first uh, real book. When I was an education uh, reporter, I did some sort of smaller books that were strictly for uh, an education audience. What uh, surprised you about writing a book? Well, that I was able to um, do it on uh, Saturdays and Sundays in my spare time. This was my weekend project during 1991, and I had to turn in a hundred and I don't know thirty or forty thousand words, and had to do it in a year, and so. Uh, I suppose my first uh, concern was, am I going to be able to do this in my spare time? I didn't take a, a leave of anything for the paper. I didn't really want to take any time away from my job at the newspaper. And so uh, the, th the thing I suppose that surprised me is that I was able to uh, do it and keep my uh, marriage and uh, family intact and, and, and not stay up all night working. I was able to do it as a sort of Saturday and Sunday endeavor. Any reaction from anybody that surprised you so far to your book? Do justices read it, you know? Uh, I took copies up to them, and um, I have not heard anything from them, but I just took them up, so I, I don't assume that they're going to throw down all their other work in uh, this month and uh, and read this book and write me their uh, uh, reactions. I, I'll obviously look forward to hearing what comments, if any, they have. Where were you born? In McKeesport, Pennsylvania, which is uh, south of Pittsburgh. What kind of family did you grow up in? Well, I had one sister. My parents are both still alive and still in Keysport, uh, fans of uh, C-SPAN. My father was an engineer, uh, not a lawyer. I never, uh, no journalists in the family and no lawyers, so I, I don't know what that means. How would you get interested in journalism? Uh, just in college, uh, writing was the one thing I liked to do and did reasonably well. And... Uh, I was not on any school paper or whatever, but it was something I... And plus, I was interested in public affairs and politics. How did you get... Uh, where did you get your education? I went to the University of North Carolina and to Northwestern to the Graduate School of Journalism. How did you get to Los Angeles? I was covering education here in the late 70s, as I mentioned, and I'd written some pieces for the Post and had done... And they were looking for an education writer, and um, I wanted to work for a, you know, a, a real newspaper, and... Uh, and uh, the L.A. Times was uh, nice enough to hire me to go out there and cover education. Uh, so I was out in California for five years. Do you get any sense of how much interest there really is in the public at large for Supreme Court matters? How hard is it for you to get a story in your paper? Not hard. My editors are quite interested in the uh, court. I think they believe that the, you know, the Supreme Court is the institution that uh, draws the line uh, between the powers of the government and the and the rights of individuals and uh, their decisions uh, last in a way that uh, few other decisions of uh, any government institution do and, and and they really do take on sort of fundamental issues so I, I found my paper has a great interest in the uh, court not only sort of what the court has decided but why uh, what uh, did the majority say what did the dissenters say? What does this decision mean for uh, 
you know, the states or for individuals? What's the scope of it? How does it compare with what the court said during its more liberal era? So I, I find there's a lot of interest in the uh, Supreme Court. I can't gauge, uh, you know, sort of the reaction around the country. You spend a lot of time in the book talking about how justices are chosen, mm -hmm. how the process worked. Mm -hmm. Which one of the modern day, say modern day, the modern day choices more than anything else, uh, was the most interesting for you to trace and how someone was chosen? Well, that's a tough question. Uh, uh, I, I covered Rehnquist and Scalia because they were in 86. The, the Kennedy nomination and confirmation was interesting, but not strictly because of Anthony Kennedy. It was because it was that, you know, huge fight during the summer of 87 of first Robert Bork and, and then uh, Doug Ginsburg and then uh, Anthony Kennedy. And I really think that was the key uh, confirmation fight because the court really had been split uh, four to four, and and that's why the there was such a fight over Robert Bork because all the liberal groups and the civil rights groups knew that that ninth seat uh, would really decide would tip the balance of the court one way or another, and that's why they went so f far out to get uh, to go after Bork. So I thought that was fascinating, but but I also thought Rehnquist and Scalia was an interesting uh, thing because it was it was not known by the public at all. I mean this was a a fairly momentous decision and no one knew it was coming until the day that um, I think it was about two o'clock in the afternoon one day in June um, President Reagan walked into the uh, press room and had uh, Warren Berger with him and uh, uh, William Rehnquist and, uh, and uh, Nino Scalia it was uh, entirely kept under wraps in the uh, in the Reagan White House Rehnquist had been known for a long time as the sort of conservative's favorite person on the Supreme Court, the sort of lone ranger of the conservative, of, of the court of the uh, Berger years, the person who staked out the positions on, on the right. Um, the Attorney General Meese, uh, Brad Reynolds in the Justice Department, and the people in the White House, in the Reagan White House, were really frustrated that the Supreme Court had blocked so much of what they wanted to do. And then they really were able to spring this something of a surprise of of uh, getting two uh, really powerful conservatives moving Rehnquist up to be the chief justice and the dominant figure and getting somebody as as uh, powerful as Scalia to fill that ninth seat and uh, so I, I thought that was a uh, I think will be seen in retrospect in history as a real turning point for the Supreme Court that no one anticipated uh, it coming at that time. Is there a single person that you could find in the Justice Department or the White House that had made the decision that Justice Rehnquist should be the Chief Justice once Warren Burger quit back in, what was it, the year 86? 86, the spring of 86. The two people that I talked about were Brad Reynolds, uh, William Bradford Reynolds, who was Mises' top deputy, and a another one of his close friends and allies, uh, Chuck Cooper. Uh, Cooper had been a clerk for Rehnquist in the late 70s. Uh, was a top official in the um, Justice Department and was the one person along with Brad Reynolds who said Bill Rehnquist is the ideal Chief Justice for a Reagan court. There had been something of a tradition of looking outside the court, not picking one of the sitting justices to move up to Chief, but uh, I think Chuck Cooper and Brad Reynolds were the key people in uh, picking um, Rehnquist to be chief. Where are, where's Chuck Cooper today? Both of them are working at law firms here in town. Brad Reynolds is at a law firm? Yes. And yeah. Ed Meese is where? Well, he's, I think, working at one of the, uh, uh, is it the Heritage uh, Foundation? One of the foundations in, in town still does a lot of speaking and some writing, um, but is, is not doing, uh, is not working as a private attorney in town. What in Justice Rehnquist's background led him to the court in the first place. In other words, is there a thread through all these appointments that you can find that if someone's grown up and decides they want to be on the Supreme Court someday, what do they do? Where do they go? What schooling do they need? Well, um, Rehnquist had an interesting uh, background because uh, he was a top student at the Stanford Law School in the early 50s, and uh, Robert Jackson, a, a Roosevelt appointee to the court, came out to Stanford and a professor introduced Rehnquist to him and uh, and Jackson it turned out needed a clerk during a middle term in 1952 you know coming in January and Rehnquist was graduating early so he asked Rehnquist to come back to Washington he uh, drove a Studebaker across the country and got here in 
in the winter of 1952. And so he had a year and a half here as a clerk in uh, 1952 and 53, the height of the McCarthy era, uh, the time of the steel seizure case. The Brown versus Board of Education case was coming up to the court. Rehnquist had actually written memos on that subject. So one way that you can sort of get into the court and really get to know a lot about it is, is getting one of the clerkships coming out of um, law school. And I think most of the clerks will tell you that from then on out for the rest of their lives, they, they are obsessively interested in the Supreme Court and its, its workings because essentially their first job out of school, they saw it up close. They spend a year or a year and a half, or sometimes two years as being the person who reads all the briefs, that co the appeals that come in and writing memos from the justices and, and getting a sense of the interplay of the court. Rehnquist, um, after he, uh, his uh, clerkship ran out in 1953, became a lawyer in Phoenix and was out in Phoenix for uh, 15 or 16 years. He was active in the Barry Goldwater campaign, but of course, as you know, Goldwater lost. He had worked closely with Richard Kleindienst, who then came into the Nixon Justice Department in 1969, and, and he recommended Rehnquist. So he came to Washington in the Nixon administration in 1969. And uh, when there were two vacancies in uh, 1971, President Nixon, I think, was interested in a, somebody who was a smart conservative lawyer, not a sort of Eastern establishment type. Uh, and Rehnquist fit the bill. He, he was not particularly well known, but certainly was a brilliant uh, thinker, extremely conservative, uh, relatively young, uh, was not well known. And, uh, and at that time, Nixon picked both Lewis Powell, who was well known as a, as a Richmond attorney and a former president of the American Bar Association, and uh, Rehnquist. Um, Byron White also served as a clerk and um, John Paul Stevens served as a clerk uh, in the 40s. All these justices, former judges? No, no, uh, some, some yes and, s well, let me think. Uh, Byron White went into the Justice Department and then directly to the Supreme Court. Rehnquist was in the Justice Department and then directly to the Supreme Court. Uh, Sandra O'Connor had been a state court judge. David Souter was a state court judge. They have something of a similar background. Clarence Thomas spent a year on the uh, appeals court. Uh, Nino Scalia spent several years on the appeals court here. Most of them had at least a little judicial experience, but not, not all. How about schools? It, I, I vaguely remember that Senator Day O'Connor was a Stanford graduate also. Yeah, I think we're about evenly divided between Harvard Law School and Stanford Law School. I think it's 4-3 or, or whatever, and I think Stanford is, is uh, creeping up. In this... Uh, in your book, you also uh, talk a lot about cases. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard for us to flush out any of these cases in great detail here, but uh, how do you, let's say for instance, that in your work you want to get a case, you want to read what some of these justices have written, where do you find it? What like, they where have would you go today? And like, if you want to go find a case that was written in 86 or you want to find a decision, how, where do you physically go find the decision? Well, any, uh, I think any, uh Big library or law library has the Supreme Court opinions on file. And if you had to pick a justice uh, that's sitting today that you wanted to read the opinions just for the fun of the writing, who would you pick? I think Scalia, particularly his dissents. Uh, but Scalia, I think, is the best writer, the person who sort of hammers home his points the hardest and in sort of clear language uh, doesn't uh, is not given to a lot of legalism. I think he's the best writer now. Rehnquist was terrific during the 70s as a, uh, particularly as the dissenter in saying what's wrong with the uh, more liberal court. A lot of them are best in dissents because when you're writing a majority opinion, it's some, you have to remember this is a, sort of a committee of nine lawyers. And, and majority opinions are to some degree committee opinions. And you know the old adage about committees. You have to write in a way that the others are going to go along with it. And if they don't like something, they'll say, I'll only sign your opinion if you change the following three sentences. So you tend to write a little mushier than you would if you're writing for yourself. Um, but if you're dissenting and you think your majority of your colleagues are dead wrong, that's the time you can sit down behind the computer and sort of pound out a dissent and really tell them what you think. So they, frequently the most interesting writing, the most pointed writing, 
is the uh, is in the dissents. How many of the justices write their own opinions? What's the folklore on that? Well, I think um, I think all of them have help from their clerks, and I think all of them do some of their writing. I think Thurgood Marshall, towards the end, really did none, and partly because of a physical problem, he had bad eyesight. He just found it very difficult even to see the uh, pages. I think. Uh, Scalia and Stevens probably do the most writing of any of the uh, justices. But you have to remember, the majority opinion, again, if it, let's say if it's 30 pages long, the first four or five pages may be just summarizing the facts of the case and what the lower courts have um, said. So, you know, if you're Justice uh, Brian Lamb, you can say to yourself, well, I'm going to write the majority opinion that decides this case, but I'll let my clerks handle those first five pages just sort of laying out the facts I'll obviously read over and make sure it says what I want to say. But I'm going to write the pages that are sort of the heart of what we're ruling. So I think a lot of the justices do that. They want to be very clear about the holding of the court. What is it we're deciding in this court, in this case? What are we saying to lower courts? So they'll spend a lot of time writing that and let the clerks sort of flesh out um, the other parts of the opinion. And a lot of them are uh, just adding citations from other cases, and the clerks can, can fill in that sort of material. How many, let me ask you a lot of little questions about the court, how many clerks does each justice have? There are a lot, four. Some of them have fewer. Rehnquist uh, likes to play doubles with his clerks, only has three, so they have a nice doubles team, but most of them uh, have four. You, you say in here rather strongly, I, I kid to figure out whether it's lighthearted or not, that if you can't play tennis, you aren't going to make it to uh, the clerkship for the chief justice. Yeah, I shouldn't, I shouldn't push that as an absolute... Uh, truism it's sort of the joke among the other clerks that uh, that Rehnquist clerks you have to be a smart lawyer but you also need to be at least passable on the tennis court have you ever done a breakdown of the clerks and whether they're men or women or blacks or white or Hispanics and what kind of uh, what kind of demographic there's been over the years that you've been around there I see them in the cafeteria and then so that's not a very scientific way to do it I think there are some there's an increasing number of women clerks some blacks and Hispanics, but, but relatively few. If you take uh, nine justices times uh, four, there may be one black law clerk uh, uh, a uh, term, but mostly white males. Does, do the laws that apply to the rest of the society, you know, this has been a constant subject of discussion in the recent uh, years, that the laws often don't apply to Congress, that apply to the rest of the society. Do they apply to the Supreme Court? No, no, not, I mean, you know, there's no, you know, there's no, uh, you can't uh, sue them for sex discrimination or something for not hiring enough female clerks. How many clerks, I mean, how are the clerks chosen? And do they come from, is there a pattern that they come from a certain school or schools? Uh, I think each justice is different. I mean, uh, uh, Rehnquist, for example, likes to get a variety of people with different backgrounds. Some justices are known for only hiring, you know, Harvard, Yale, Stanford graduates. I think it very much differs by justices of... Uh, Law students send in resumes. They get recommendations from uh, lower court judges. Frequently now, they've spent a year on a lower court with a district judge or an appeals court judge, and that district judge then can recommend them. So a lot of them come through that. Uh, recommendations from other judges that say one of the Supreme Court justices knows and likes and can, can rely on. If somebody's watching this and uh, they're listening to us talk, we've talked a lot about personalities and... and right. uh, it, and we're running out of time, we've got about 10 minutes left, but, but if somebody says, what is, you know, is that David Savage book all about personalities? I know it isn't, but let you, you describe to them what else do they get in this book, and there's a lot more in here besides the personality part. Well, I've, I read, wrote the book in a chronological way. I uh, really started in 1986 with, and sort of laid out the, um, the scene of Rehnquist and Scalia sort of coming down the steps is now the it's now the Rehnquist court on the day in September of 86 when Rehnquist became chief. And then I sort of uh, walked the reader through the five term, five years up through 1991 and the Clarence Thomas nomination. And what I, I think I uh, t tried to show, again, was I would take the four or five big issues before the court, say, in the 1986 and 1987, and give some sense of... The, how the court argued these cases, the reaction of the justices, sort of back and forth. And then in the spring, how these cases came out. 
And I made the point in 86, 87 that very little happened. Uh, it, uh, the, William Brennan, the longtime liberal leader of the court, was able to win a lot of the big civil rights cases and uh, the religion cases. And th nothing much changed, even though Scalia and Rehnquist had, uh, had come to the court. Well, then on the last day of the 1987 term, Lewis Powell stepped down, and that's what set off the battle over Robert Bork. And then, and then I think I tried to show in the terms that followed after how the court really had changed. Suddenly there were five votes. I mean, Brennan always used that line of, uh, with his new clerks that, you know, what's the most important role at the Supreme Court? And the, the law graduates would look at him and come up with a few legal rules, and Brennan would hold up his hand and say, it's the rule of five. It take, takes five votes to do anything at the Supreme Court. And Brennan was a master for years at finding five votes for liberal positions. Uh, once Justice Kennedy took his seat in 1988, it Rehnquist suddenly had five votes for a lot of conservative positions where he didn't before, to cut back on the separation of church and state, to cut back on the reach of the federal uh, job discrimination laws. Do you remember in the spring of 1989, there were six or seven cases involving civil rights and job discrimination where the court on five to four votes trimmed back some earlier interpretation of the uh, civil rights laws. Uh, that was the year at the flag burning case. I think that was the, the great exception to the rule. The, I think the free speech clause of the First Amendment is the one uh, provision of the Bill of Rights that has strong support even on a very conservative court. Uh, Scalia and Justice Kennedy I think Justice Souter are strong proponents of free speech for a lot of reasons. One is that nobody can deny there's a free speech clause in the Constitution. It's not one that, you know, that Scalia says, oh, they made up, you know, they made it up somewhere, a right to privacy or a right to abortion. There's unquestionably a free speech clause there. So the uh, flag burning case was a great symbolic fight that spring. There's drug testing was another uh, big issue. Uh, whether you can execute 16-year-olds. Uh, a 16-year-old commits a murder and say uh, Missouri uh, sends that person to death. Is that cruel and unusual punishment? Is it cruel and unusual punishment to execute somebody who's a mentally retarded person who commits a murder? Those were great cases that divided the court five to four and and I tried to give some sense of the um, of the battle over those cases and the division of opinion among the justices and and uh, it's one of the great things about the court, they have to decide. I mean, they, they don't just sit around and debate these issues. They have to finally decide. How do you come down one way or the other? Yeah. Uh, you tell a lot of stories about how they're, again, how they're chosen. And, and I, I bring this up uh, because I want to know, and it's kind of an open-ended question, how much new information in that area is there in here? Like, example, and you might tell the story, is we, we don't have much time the of what Anthony Kennedy had to go through, mm -hmm. the trip to Washington, cooling his heels for a couple of days, and then being told, no, you aren't yeah. the pick. Yeah. How much of that kind of thing is new? Well, I think some of that is new. I, I, uh, Justice Kennedy was kind enough to talk to me about that, and he went through a real meat grinder for a couple of weeks of, of you know, the, being appointed to the Supreme Court is a once in a lifetime, it's a, it's a lightning bolt for any um, lawyer or judge. Uh, he had come in here and was was viewed as the front runner for the um, seat once uh, Robert Bork had been voted down. He, he was uh, strongly supported by a number of people in the White House. Uh, the press had viewed him as the likely contender. Uh, he was staying with a friend in uh, Virginia, one of his clerks' house. He expected to get a call that morning saying, you know, you're going to come down to the White House and you're going to be the president's nominee. And it turned out at the last minute that, um, that uh, Ed Meese and Brad Reynolds decided to go with um, Doug Ginsburg, who had worked in the Reagan Justice Department. And uh, I think that would have been a crushing experience for a lot of people. Kennedy seemed to take it with real equanimity and got on the first plane and flew back to uh, Sacramento and was ready to resume his life of being a, an appeals court judge in uh, uh, Sacramento. He was heading off to Samoa, he told me to do, a, he was judging some cases out there, and he told his wife, you know, it was a 
lifetime in Washington or a week of Samoa was the second prize, so I got second prize the week in Samoa. He went out there and uh, he happened to be <laughs> out in Samoa during the time that uh, the Doug Ginsburg's nomination was collapsing. And if you recall, it, he only lasted about a week. There were a series of stories uh, undercutting Ginsburg. He was not well known. And then there was the story about having smoked marijuana as a professor at, at Harvard Law and the administration really asked him to step down. And then uh, Kennedy got a call during the middle of the night from Ed Meese saying, you know, this, this time this is it, Tony. And uh, he got another plane and came back here. And this time, of course, he was the nominee. So it was a, it was a, it would be a very trying period for anybody. But I say I was very impressed by how uh, well he took both the uh, defeat and then the, uh, and then finally, of course, was delighted to get the uh, nomination. You dedicate this book for Manning and Whitley. Those are my two children. How ten, old are they? Ten and six. And uh, Manning, in particular, is somebody who does not like to sit down and write. Uh, he's, I have to push him a little bit to get him to do uh, schoolwork. So I, I thought, you know, I'll show him. See, Manning, uh, there's, there's some payoff to be sitting still and, and, uh, and writing, and uh, I hope this is some minor inspiration for him. You say in the preface that most of the members of the court agreed to speak with me. You want to tell us who didn't? No, I'd rather not. Uh, I, there's so few um, members of the court, and I, as you mentioned in some of the quotes, I'd say a, a justice believed this or that. I'd rather not get into limiting the number and going through which ones were willing to talk at some length and which ones weren't. Your book's endorsed by both sides of the political spectrum. Patricia Ireland from the... Uh, now organization and Bruce Fine, a conservative uh, constitutional scholar, was that hard to get? Well, I, I, they were kind enough to offer to read the book. I sent it around to a number of people, and uh, and I was pleased that they had nice things to say about it. But uh, I was, I did, as I say, tried to make it a book that uh, that both sides of the spectrum could find something worthwhile in it. Our guest has been David G. Savage. This is what the book looks like. It's called Turning Right, The Making of the Rehnquist Supreme Court. Thank you very much for joining us. Good to be here, Brian.